So you may start now. Okay. Good afternoon, everyone. Today we have with us Dr. Sam Dupont from Switzerland. One minute, I have to share my screen. Yeah, is, is it visible now? No, sir, not yet. Still not? No. Right. Yeah. Is it okay? Not yet. It has not come. Okay, now it's coming. It will take some time. I think. Okay. Okay, now it has come. You can make it full so screen. Is it full screen now? Not yet, but I think it will take some time. Anyway, you may, may start. You may start. Okay. So we are very fortunate enough to have Dr. Sam Dupont, Associate Professor and Senior Lecturer, Department of Biological and Environmental Sciences, University of Gothenburg, Sweden. He is has a vast area of research. He is basically a a pioneer researcher in ocean acidification and climate change biology. And his area of research focus on global warming, ocean acidification, ecophysiology of marine animals, comparative biology, experimental design of to capital response of environmental changes due to anthropocene. He has many awards and achievements to his credit. He is head of the capacity building program and member of the executive council of the Ocean Acidification International Coordination Center, OAICC. He is a contributing author on the intergovernmental panel on Patient. climate change. He is going to play a more prominent role to Member of executive council of Global Ocean Acidification Observing Network, OA ON, and chair of the biological working group. He is a member of the steering committee of the Center for Solar Radiation Research. Mm -hmm. He has a much author and co author of several in national and international in research grants. Testing to see whether like EU FPS7, EU, uh, EU IPN, Formas, VR, etc. He is a coordinator of seven Lovian ocean acidification facilities and hosting more than 10 research themes or projects every year. He has published more than 185 research publications in highly reputed journals including Nature, PNS, and Free, uh, sorry, and having phenomenal 8,000 feet in the high region. He has been having a for international journals. Okay. So with this introduction, I will call Dr. Dupont to deliver his lecture titled Get Ready for Ocean Acidification. Over to you, Dr. Dupont. Thank you very much. I'm going to start by sharing my screen. Uh, oops. That. All right. Um, I, I have one right. announcement. You mute yourself. Except speaker, no one is allowed to speak. Please do it. Otherwise, I am forced to force him to leave this uh, uh, forum. Okay? Please do it. Otherwise, it is very distracting. I can Thank still you. hear some background noise. Can you see my screen now? Yeah, it's done. Can you see my my screen is visible for everyone, right? All right. So thank you very much for the nice introduction and the invitation. This is a great pleasure for me to be here. In a way, that's one of the positive side effects of this terrible COVID-19 situation is that there are more and more of these virtual talks, which give the opportunity to actually share with more and more people. And I think, I hope that's something we're going to keep doing after the crisis. And so it's great for me to be there in a different continent, a different country to talk about my work. 
So I, I titled my talk, Get Ready for Ocean Acidification. And what I will try to do really is to, to give another view and different point of view on, on this issue that, that is ocean acidification. So the first part of my talk will be about the science we know today. So what is ocean acidification and why we should care about it. The second part will be more about what we can do about it. So talk about what kind of science do we need if we really want to address the issue, which is increased carbon dioxide emission into the atmosphere. And the second part will be about how can we buy some time, like it's the adaptation strategies and, and also the fact that in many countries today, the real challenge is capacity building. We need to transfer knowledge, we need to build adapted labs and so on. And then I will finish by a small conclusion and discuss a little about the future of the field in, in the light of, of the UN, UN Ocean Decade that's going to start next year. But start, first, let's start by, by what is ocean acidification. And acidification basically is a consequence, is one of the many consequences actually of, of the growing human populations. We are more and more on the planet, as you know. And today, if we want to keep everyone happy, healthy, having a job, having a house, we need fossil fuel. As, as a source of energy. So it's still one of our major source of energy. And because of that, we are releasing a large amount of carbon dioxide in, into the atmosphere. And we know it's not without consequences. The, the, because of this increase of carbon dioxide into the atmosphere, we have all these different effects. We have climate change on one side with global warming, more and more catastrophic events. The ice is melting in multiple parts of the world, leading to sea level rise, hypoxia, salinity change. And more recently, like maybe about 20 years ago, science, the science community started to be worried about another consequence of carbon dioxide emission, and it's, it's ocean acidification. And that's going to be the central theme of, 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 what, of my talk today. So acidification is, is not a climate change issue. It, it's another consequence of carbon dioxide emission. So in a way, it's, it's easier to understand because the science, the basic science behind ocean acidification is relatively simple. If you put more carbon dioxide into the atmosphere, about one third is absorbed by the ocean. And the thing is that this is a great service that the ocean is providing us because it's, it's limiting the amount of carbon dioxide into the atmosphere, so limiting climate change. But on the other hand, this is not without consequences because if you put carbon dioxide into water, it turned into carbonic acid. And because of that, it's making the ocean more acidic. And, and this is something that you can observe all around the world now. So you have more and more monitoring stations in different parts of the world, and they all kind of show the same trend. And that's one of the classic uh, monitoring station in Hawaii, the Mono Loa station, where you can see in red on the picture that you have this, this steady increase in carbon dioxide into the atmosphere. In, in yellow, you can see this is the associated increase in carbon dioxide into the seawater. And in blue, this is decrease in pH, so in acidity. All these bodies, so what, that these practices are being done under... I'm sorry, there is someone speaking please, in the background. Please move yourself, please. <laughs> That's all right. Uh, so basically what you can also see is that the pH is decreasing. So you have this, this increase in carbon dioxide and decrease in acidity, which is basically what is called ocean acidification. And this is a completely different time scale and another classic graph. And that's the reason why scientists were really worried about ocean acidification. And because if you, this is a graph representing over the last 20 million years how the pH, the average pH in the ocean was. And you can see that the, the average pH is always above, above 8 and, and sometimes higher. And what we are doing now is on the right hand side of the graph is that we have this drastic and fast decrease in, in pH. So it's going much below anything that has been observed in the last 20 million years. And, and that's what is really scary. It's happening really fast. And it's also really strong. So basically what we expect by the end of the century, if we keep producing carbon dioxide as we do today, is about a 0 0.3, 0 0.4 pH decrease. And it doesn't sound really scary like this, but pH is a logarithmic scale, meaning that this decrease in pH will lead to a doubling in acidity by the end of this century. So it's, it's kind of a really rapid and really strong change in acidity in the ocean. So we know for sure, and it's been, that has been really well documented all around the world, 
that ocean acidification is happening. It is real, it is fast, and it's directly related to our carbon dioxide emissions. So there is very little space here for deniers because this is something that you measure and it's very easy to understand. The next question is really, does it matter? Does, does that change in chemistry will have an impact on, on the things we care about in the ocean? And the answer, unfortunately, is yes. There are many ways that we can look at ocean acidification impacts, and one is going back in time and check in the history of Earth when something similar happened. And the last time something like ocean acidification happened, it was at the end of the Permian. And at the end of the Permian, what you had was because of an increased activity of the volcanoes, it's also a big climate change situation. So temperature rose, you also have pH decrease and so on. And what happened at the time as a combination of all these factors, so very similar to what is happening today, is that you had one of the mass extinctions. So it was the third extinction and one of the worst ones that ever happened on Earth. So for example, 92% of all the marine creatures went extinct. So of course, I'm not saying that something similar is gonna to happen today, but that's a good indication that we should worry about it. Actually, if you want to understand what acidification is, we need to do a little bit more of chemistry. So I told you that you have an increase in carbon dioxide in the water that interact with the seawater, turn into carbonic acid, and really quickly the carbonic acid dissociate into bicarbonate that is increasing in the water, and also an increase in proton. And the proton will respond with, or will interact with the carbonate ion and turn into carbonic acid. So basically what you have is an increase in carbon dioxide, an increase in bicarbonate ion, a decrease in carbonate ion, and a decrease in pH. So all these things might be really important in terms of biology, because some organisms will respond to some of these ions. So the, the seawater will become more acidic, but also in some places, seawater will become corrosive, meaning that if you have a calcium carbonate structure, for example, like the coral reefs, they will start to dissolve. And also you're gonna have decreased access to carbonate. And at the time, chemists thought that my, that might have also consequence for the many organisms in the ocean that are calcifying. So producing calcium carbonate structure for their shelf, shell or their, or their skeleton. So that's why at the beginning of the field, there was a lot of interest in the response of calcifiers to, to acidification. And a lot of experiment has been done in the lab where people were taking marine calcifiers and exposed them to different pH scenario and see what was happening. And, and at the first, there was like a lot of really negative response to low pH to ocean acidification that have been documented. And for example, on the left, you can see phytoplankton called coccolithophores. So they are phytoplankton, but covered by calcium carbonate structure. And if you expose them to acidification, you can see on the right hand side of the picture that they start to have trouble building a nice skeleton. Corals, of course, were also really well studied, and this is the same kind of story. So, for example, the, the, the example you have on the top right, uh, a, a scientist called, called Maus Fine exposed pieces of coral reefs to, to low pH for several months, and what he saw is that the corals survived really well. So the polyps, they were really healthy, but they were completely unable to produce and maintain the skeleton. So there were corals, healthy corals, but not coral reef. And that's the problem, of course, because in, in nature, all the services that are provided by coral reefs are produced by the reef itself. So if you can't maintain a reef, that will have really dramatic consequences. And then a bunch of other calcifiers were also studied, urchins, bivalves, including oysters, mussels, and so on. And most of the time were showing negative effect. And that can really have really strong negative effect. And a good example is what happened with this species you see on the screen now. So it's called a brittle star. And here where I live, it's really, really an important species. If you go in the North Atlantic and check around 10, 20 meters, you're going to see huge beds formed by these guys. And if you expose their larvae to low pH, so that was my very first experiment in 2008, what uh, I, I, I did is I exposed the larvae to, to a scenario you can expect within 20, 30 years, so this 7.9 pH as compared to 8.1 today. What I could see is that they just couldn't survive. So if you see on the top uh, 8.1 pictures, you can see this is how la normal larvae looks like after a week. So you have what is called a beautiful pluteus larvae with a nice skeleton in green. 
if you expose them to future scenario of ocean acidification, so a 0.2 pH decrease, they just couldn't form the larvae. They were a blob of cells trying to calcify it, but unsuccessfully. And within seven days, they were all dead. So in that case, it shows that if we don't cut carbon dioxide emission within a few decades, some species will be gone. There will be species extinction. And in that case, if that species is gone, hundreds of other species that depends on them will be gone too. And even worse, uh, we already have evidence today that acidification is impacting things we care about. And that's a story I will tell you in more details later. But in 2007, on the west coast of the US, there was a really strong impact of acidification on oysters, and in particular in aquaculture of oysters. So basically the oyster farmer were totally unable to produce oysters that year, and it was because of ocean acidification. So to summarize, Acidification is happening, it's documented everywhere, and we have a bunch of evidence from field, from lab, from paleo reconstruction showing that it will have a negative impact on many species. And if we take a, a check on, on the history of the field, that's more or less what the situation was around 2003. At the time, the chemists were predicting, okay, acidification is happening, that's gonna have impact on calcifiers, and you started to have a bunch of papers showing that yes, many calcifiers and some of them being really important like like corals like seafood are negatively impacted but then other papers started to be published and show that well many species were actually doing quite fine with ocean acidification and in 2013 when the ipcc report was was released 50 percent they were showing that 50 percent of all the marine animals that were tested for ocean acidification response were showing negative effect in response to acidification. But that also means that the other 50% were showing either no response or a positive response. And as an example of an organism that is positively impacted by ocean acidification, we have the sea star you see on the left. So this, this is a top predator in Sweden. So it's eating everything else. So it's kind of the lion of, of, of the fjord here. And, uh, and what we did, we exposed again their larvae to low pH, similar scenarios that you can expect by the end of this century. And basically, they loved it. We couldn't spot any negative effect, despite the fact that they are calcifier, by the way. But they were growing faster. They were surviving the same. So they were doing just fine. And the picture on the right, you can see that the, the juvenile on the left come from today's condition, when the one on the right comes from future conditions. So not all species will be, will be negatively impacted. Some will be winners. But on, on, on the other hand, when you have stuff like this, where you have contrasting results depending on what species you study. It's really annoying when you want to talk to policymakers because if a policymaker come and say, okay, I'm really interested in what's going to happen to my fish, to my sea star, to my, to my uh, oyster or mussel in the future, and you say, well, I, I, don't really, I can't really tell, tell you what's going to happen. I need to test it in the lab. And of course, we can't test all species of, of the world in the lab. That, that's not possible. So at the time, you started to have confusion a little bit in the field. It was obvious that some species will be negatively impacted, but it was very difficult to predict what species will be a winner and what species will be a loser. So if you have this graph again, when you have the level of confidence of the scientists through time, we went into a dip because at that time, it started to be a little bit more confusing. People would, would not be able to predict why, why a species was positively or negatively impacted. And, and the reason why the results were contrasting come, came from the realization that pH can be very different depending on where you are. So if you put a pH meter where you are and you compare to the pH in the ocean where I am, we might be very likely going to see very different things. So pH is not something that is constant all around the world. And the first difference is if you measure the pH in the open ocean, it's relatively stable. If you measure the open ocean anywhere in the world, you're going to have similar results. So pH between 8 and 8.1 and very stable there. You can see on the top of the graph here. But then if you go to the coast, you have very different results. Like in, on the coastal zone, the pH varied dramatically on different timescales from day, night to 
seasons. And you can see that on the, on the graph on the bottom, which is a coral reef. And you can see that if, despite having the same scale on the y-axis, the level of variation is very different in the coastal zone as compared to the open ocean. And this variability comes from currents, from upwelling events, from also biology, so the balance between photosynthesis and respiration and so on. So all that create variability. And when you have variability, that means organisms have to adapt to this. And that means they will be, depending on where they live, more or less sensitive to pH. Because if they're experiencing today a lot of variability, they will be really good at coping with low pH. And a good example of that is what you can find on the deep sea. If you go in the deep sea, you're going to find sometimes these vents and that has been uh, discovered in the, the 1980s. Uh, and what they, you, you have around these vents is communities that are adapted to really extreme condition. And if you check the pH close to a vent, it's 5.4. It's extremely low pH, lower than anything that you will find ever on the surface. And the saturation state is 0 0.01, meaning the water is extremely corrosive. That means if you put a piece of calcium carbonate there, it's going to dissolve in no time. But what do you find there? You find a lot of life, including a lot of calcifiers. So the picture on the right, you can see that you have muscles that are beautifully developed with beautiful skeleton, and they can survive there with no problem because they are adapted to it. So they develop mechanisms to cope with low pH. So basically, that was the missing piece in our understanding of acidification that would explain why some species do better than others. It's because they are adapted to the variability of today. And basically, that a stress is only when you deviate from what to, you know. So for example, a pH of 5.4 is not a stress for the deep sea mussels because that's what they are used to. But if you go on the surface where mussels are exposed to pH 8, if you expose them to 5, of course, they're going to be super mega stressed. So that was the, 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 the key piece of information we needed to predict why a species was more sensitive than another, or even why a population was more impacted than another. And we've made this paper uh, in 2017 with some colleague from Chile, where we will try to put this concept of local adaptation in action to try to explain contradic contradicting results. So what these guys did for many years is like experiment where they were testing different species. You can see copepods, mussels, and so on. And they were always comparing two different scenarios, like something that is 400 ppm, which is the concentration of, of CO2 into the atmosphere, and something that is higher, like around 1,000. And what they were saying is that depending on the population, of, of that they were studying, even of the same species, sometimes they were seeing completely different results. So let's say, for example, if you check the bottom part, you have copepods. So they were exposing copepods from two different populations, from a coastal and an estuarine population, to the same scenario, so 400, 12, 12, 1200. And then checking the response, and for one population, they had a negative effect of acidification, and for the other one, they had a positive effect. Same species, just two different populations. So we realized, that's just because the population in the estuarine environment is exposed to more variability, so they are just tougher there. And we tried to reanalyze all the information in the literature with that in mind. And what we did is instead of using this absolute value of PCO2 or pH, but relative to what they, they know today. And what we showed on that graph is that the more you go on the right of the x-axis, is the more you deviate from what they are used to. And, and, and then the, on the X, y axis is, is basically an indicator of the response. So the more, if it's negative, you have a negative response. If it's a positive, you have a positive response. So what you can see is the more you deviate from what you know, the more negatively impacted the, the, it is. So that shows the important, if you want to study acidification where you are, to basically go where your organism live and understand what kind of variability they experience today. So. That was the key we missed at the time. I know we start to really understand this, uh, and that's, that's where we were already in 2012. We had a better understanding of what we didn't know, and we started to do research at what was most adapted. Uh, and this research went into three different directions. Its, it's first uh, experiments started to be longer term, because most of the first experiments were done short term, like a few weeks. So to realize justification is something that's going to happen over decades. So experiments now are longer. They also consider multiple stressors. So acidification is not happening alone. It's happening with increased temperature, with other stressors. And then 
people from move from were studying one species to the whole ecosystem. So everything starts to get a little bit more complexified. I know we have a better picture of what's happening. So if you want to summarize the first part of the talk, is that acidification is, is a direct consequence of all carbon dioxide emissions. So that's for sure it's happening. We can see it all around the world. The impact on marine organisms is for sure. So we have tons of evidence showing that there will be consequence for marine ecosystem and species, but it's kind of difficult to predict without a better understanding of where the organism live. Because if you understand that, then you start to have a better idea of what's gonna happen. So now we start to have the theoretical understanding of, the, of how to better study acidification. And we start to have models that allows us to predict if a species, if an ecosystem will be impacted or not. So the first part is maybe a little bit depressing, is like we are facing a huge challenge, which is ocean acidification, that will have for sure consequences for things we care about. But I don't want to stop on something negative. So let's move to the second part of the talk, which is about, okay, now we know we have a problem, what can we do about it? And in a way, we are facing this situation. So on the right hand side, that's us, that's the human species, depending on the ocean for its survival, for food, for the air we breathe and so on. And on the left hand side, this is ocean acidification, climate change and so on. So when you're in a situation like that, the poor little mouse in face of this, in face of this cat, there are three things you can do. One thing is do nothing, it's just wait and see and that doesn't seem to be a good idea. The second option is to basically escape. Right, and, and the third option is to kill the cat. So the best option if you're facing something like that, of course, is to kill the cat, but for a mouse alone, that might be a difficult task. So it's maybe smarter to first escape the problem and later come back with a better plan to kill the cat. So go there, gather forces with the other mice, come back and together kill the cat. And when it comes to acidification, this is the same problem. The cat will be carbon dioxide and, 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 and the mouse would be the ocean and us. So in that case, we have two different options. Kill the cat would be mitigation, reduce carbon dioxide emissions. So we have less carbon dioxide into the atmosphere and we basically fix the problem. And the second part is adaptation, is escaping the problem. It's, it's, it's not solving it for now, but it's buying some time by reducing the impact. And I will navigate you through these two options now. So when it comes to mitigation, the real way of coping with carbon dioxide is reduce carbon dioxide emission. And that's, that's a global challenge. And that's what it makes really complicated because one country can't fix it. It has to be coped by all the countries around the world at the same time. And to do that, scientists need to convince policymakers all around the world that something needs to be done. And they also need to convince citizens that we need to, to change the way we live. We need to change the way way we consume to be more sustainable. And to do that, any kind of data would do if it's a convincing set of data. And to be honest, we know more than enough. We don't need more science to say to policymakers, if we don't cut carbon dioxide emission now, there will be negative impact in the future on us and on nature. We have tons of reports out there that are doing an excellent job at summarizing this, including the IPCC report. So we don't need more science for that. The science is extremely strong, but the problem is that it's still not happening as fast as it should. And, and why is that is a really important question because what needs to be done is to have really strong policies to reduce carbon dioxide emission. And we also need citizens to change themselves, but also to accept the policy changes. So to do that, not all science will be efficient. And if we fail in doing this, that's, we're just not going to change. A good example of, of a failure of implementing a policy is what happened in France a few years ago. So the government decided to implement a, a tax on, on fossil fuel. And, and basically, the people in the street, they didn't understand that. And they, they completely disagree. And that led to riots and fires and what is called the Gilets Jaunes movement. So People were really, really pissed because of this law. So it was a good idea from the policy side, but it was not accepted by the citizens. So we need to find a way to make both works. And I was really inspired when I was reflecting about these things by a guy called Ken Caldera. So he said, people have to sacrifice a little bit of their short-term self-interest to help the world be a better place for the long term. 
And how you get people to do that is the most important research that can be done. So his point is, is that we, we don't only need nat chemistry or natural science, we also need social science to better understand how we can make people change. And that was the thinking behind the creation of the Center for Collective Action Research that I co-founded in Sweden. And we do research on what kind of scientific information really drive change in citizens and in also in, in, in policies. Because overall, scientists tend to be really poor communicator because we are not trained to do so and we tend to be nerds, okay? We get really excited about things that nobody else cares about. I am really excited about serotonin and, and echinoderms, and of course, nobody cares. Nobody will, will change their behavior because I tell them that serotonin will be negatively impacted. So that's, that's the way we, we can reflect a little bit and try to see how can we change the way we do science to really have an influence on society. Because the way we do it today is like this. This is called the science supply paradigm, where we have a problem like acidification, we do research, we produce information and then we share that with society. Unfortunately, this is a really inefficient way of to drive change because information don't drive change most of the time. And even worse, it can create more polarization. And you can see that on social media. If people are convinced about something, they're gonna cherry pick the information they want just to reinforce their view. So what we argued is that scientists have to do science that is targeting citizens and policies to provide some specific in scientific information that will drive change. So we should have we have to move on this graph from what I call the zone of complexity, which is science with high uncertainty and high complexity and low societal value. So complex science about things that nobody cares about. And we should move into what is called the zone of consensus, where it's science that is actually simple and on what some people care about. And to test this idea, we did an experiment in Sweden. So I went into the street and asked people, what do you care about in the ocean? And not surprisingly, seafood was one of these. So I said, okay, I'm gonna do research on, on that seafood. And I focused on one species, which is the northern shrimp. This shrimp, the, the sweets, they are, they are crazy about it. So that's really a traditional meal. Everybody eats it, they all love it. So I said, if I can show a negative effect of acidification on that species, people are more will, will be more willing to listen. So what we did is we exposed the shrimp to two scenarios, uh, the water of today and the water of the future, an ocean acidification scenario. And instead of focusing on what I care about, which would be growth, respiration, I decided I'm gonna focus on the taste. So we did a tasting and actually we could demonstrate that people can taste the difference between shrimp of today and shrimp of the future exposed to acidification. So the ocean acidification shrimp don't taste as good as the shrimp of today. So we published a paper on this and then we made a press release uh, saying ocean acidification can alter the taste of shrimp. And it was extremely successful because that was a cool story basically. So the story was released and it had a huge popular impact. It was all over the internet. It was picked up by major journals like, like the BBC, like Science and so on. It also had, so that was, so it had a, an impact on people. But that doesn't mean that because people heard about this, that they would change their ways. So we decided to go one step further and we made a social experiment. So I went in, in, in town where, where I live and I compared three different ways of communicating ocean acidification. One, I actually asked some, some students to come and work with me at the station. So these guys were extremely engaged. They, heard, they knew a lot about it. They actually saw it with their own eyes. And that's it. A second group of students, I just went to school and gave a talk and explained what the problem was. And the third group had the chance to taste shrimps before and realize physically experience what ocean acidification was and then i asked them all of them are you willing to take a pledge for the environment and i offered them multiple options of things they can do in their everyday life to limit ocean acidification and then what we could see is that if i just give a talk they they are not really engaged they they, 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 they check some of these boxes so they are okay to try certain of these things but they don't really do it if they come to work with me, they are extremely engaged. So they basically implement drastic change in their way of living. Some of them became vegetarians. Some of them stopped traveling. Like there were really significant change in their behavior because they were really interested and really engaged. But interestingly, the one that also tasted the shrimps 
had the same kind of commitment. So that we showed that if you produce science, like something that is concrete, that is simple, that is physical, that leads to an emotional response, people are more willing to change. So if you decide to study something like acidification or warming, think about that. If your goal is to drive societal change, do science that people will care about and will physically experience and drive an, emo an emotional response. That's the way of driving change. So in a way, if we want to, to, to have successful mitigation, we have more than enough data to make a case, but we need more science targeting local value because that's what's going to drive change in people's mind and society. All right, so that was the first thing you can do, that's mitigation. But the problem with mitigation, so reduce carbon dioxide emission, is that it's going to take a lot of time. We know that it, it really requires coordinated actions from all around the world at the same time, and that's going to take decades. And in the meantime, if we don't do something else, we're going to have negative consequences for things we care about. And that's where the other option, which is adaptation, comes really handy. You have options, things we can do differently that will help us to buy some time to develop the mitigation strategy. And to do that, it's a completely different focus. So acidification is a global problem. It's happening everywhere around the globe, but it has a local aspect. Like the picture you see on the right is oyster farmers in Hong Kong. These guys, they don't care what's happening all around the world. They care about their livelihood. All their life, their family, well-being, and so on, depend on one resource, which is oysters. And if they can't produce their oyster, if they can't keep their livelihood, they're basically going to go into misery. So we, if we want to help them, we have to come today, not in 10 years, only 20 years, with solutions. And that's a really a local challenge, and you need to develop local options. And for that, you have to go there. You have to go talk to these people, identify their challenges, and do something with them. And we have options. We have tons of adaptation strategies. There are things we can do today to limit the negative impact of acidification, global warming, hypoxia, and so on. And among those, uh, you have, for example, protecting what we have, so produce, make some marine protected areas. We can work on reducing other stressors like pollution, overfishing. We can also restore ecosystems that are degraded, like replant mangroves, replant sea grasses, and so on. But you can also change the way we do things. And one example is we can change the way we do aquaculture. And to show you that, I'm going to talk about what happened on the west coast of the US. So I told you in 2007, the oyster farmer faced a huge problem. So the way they usually work is they go in the field, they collect oysters, and they produce baby oyster in the lab. So they spawn them, make larvae, grow them in the lab. And when they have a juvenile, a spad, they transfer them in cage outside till they grow to a market size and they can sell it. But that year, for some reason that they couldn't understand, they couldn't produce a single juvenile, a single, a single spat in the lab. And that was terrible because that means that hundreds, thousands of people would be out of jobs and no livelihood again. So that led to a big issue, like what was happening? And most of the time when you have something like this, it's, it's because of a, of a disease or, or something like that, but they couldn't identify the problem that year. And it was really happening all along the West Coast. So the first step, scientists arrived and said, okay, let's try to understand what's happening. And somebody who has been instrumental in doing this is somebody called Richard Philly from the University of Washington. So what he did is went there and he's a chemist and realized that actually what was happening, it was ocean acidification. So the pH of the water was too low for the oyster to actually develop a normal larvae and, and produce a juvenile. So he said, okay, no, we know what the problem is. The problem is ocean acidification. And they could attribute the cause of ocean acidification to carbon dioxide emission. And they could also identify all the companies that are mostly responsible for that. But again, changing that would be extremely complicated. So they say, what, what can we do? And the first thing they did is make a lot of noise about it and say, okay, we, we have a problem here. We have a lot of industries along all coast that are challenged by ocean acidification. So there really is a viral story. And what happened is that that attracted the interest of policymakers on the, in the US, in California, in Oregon, and so on. And policymakers went on the field, talked to the farmers, and realized, okay, we have an issue and something needs to be done. 
And I told you the real solution, which would be killing the cat, is reduce carbon dioxide emission. But unfortunately, to do that is going to take decades. And the farmers, they don't have a decade. They can't wait for 10, 20, or 30 years before solving the problem. So again, science came to the rescue. And scientists started to study what is happening in an oyster if you expose them to low pH. And they realized that the oyster that they culture on the west coast of the US are actually quite tough. And they can cope with, with ocean acidification pretty well, except for 24 hours in their development. So when they move from what is called the trochophore larvae to the D-shaped larvae, during that period, they basically start precipitating a huge calcium carbonate skeleton. And if the pH is too low during that period, then they just can't do it. They just die. But if you ensure that they pass that stage, after that, they will be fine. So oyster farmers, realizing this, decided to change the way they were culturing their oysters to ensure that the condition during that 24-hour window were optimal for, for, for the precipitation of the shell, and then they could resume as usual. And that technique is really great. It's a good example of adaptation of industry to a, to a problem, ocean acidification, and, 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 and buy some time. That, that solution won't work forever, but it definitely will allow the industry to buy a few decades. And hopefully in the meantime, industry, uh, society will change, or will reduce our carbon dioxide emission and prevent worse damage to happen. So we had a problem, we identified the cause, we realized that mitigation is the option, but to implement mitigation, it will take some time. So industries adapted and now they are back into business, at least for some time. And it's really important to understand that mitigation will only work, adaptation, sorry, will only work if we do both mitigation and adaptation. If you only focus on adaptation, but don't try to reduce carbon dioxide emission, at some point we're going to hit a tipping point and it's not going to work. And there was a really nice paper by Jean-Pierre Gattuso in Science in 2018 showing that for all the things we care about, we need both adaptation and mitigation. All right. So, to, find, to finish my talk, I would say there is still one aspect that I think is really important for all of you, is that if you want to fix the problem locally, for example, in India, where you, most of you are, you need to be sure that you have the right data. Because it's a local issue, you need to locally understand what's happening. So you need to go in the field, measure the pH, measure the response on marine ecosystem, and so on and so on. So that will require to have data. And today, there's many places around the world where there is absolutely no data. The, you can see it in green, that's where you have all the data you need, but Africa, part of Asia, part of Latin America is really poor in data. And the reason it's poor in data is because many of these countries don't have the capacity, so they don't have the knowledge, but they also don't have the, the adaptive laboratory. And for me, that was also really eye-opening, and that's why in the last five years, I've been involving, uh, investing a lot of my time in capacity building. So we decided we need to go in places where they don't have the capacity to collect the needed data to adapt and to mitigate, and we're going to help them to actually do this. And, and we got funds from a bunch of different sources here, and some of the first training were basic training. So we were going to, to different places, and basically, give a longer version of this talk. Like for a week, we were talking about acidification, how to measure it, and what, how to design an experiment, and so on. But really quickly along, when I was starting to teaching this, I realized that, well, there are some challenges. Like things are very different in different places. I remember when I was in South Africa the first time, one of the students came to me and said, it's really nice, this course, but it's completely useless. And I was kind of shocked because I was kind of hoping to be useful. But he said, no, most of the technique that you guys are presenting, we can't implement that in Africa. We don't have this equipment. We don't have the money to buy this equipment. So you have to find another way. And that was really a reality check for me. And I changed completely the way we are teaching now. So what we do is we developed simplified methodology that with very little money, we can go to a place and start a lab and start collecting data. And that's an example on, on the screen now of what I did in Mozambique. So when I arrived in Mozambique, they had basically a naked lab. You can see it on the left. And on the right is what we achieved within a week. And for basically $15,000. So we built a lab out of scratch. We, we made an aquarium system where we could manipulate the pH, do experiment. We did experiments in the field and so on. So we basically got them started with very little money. And we thought like that's the way to do. 
So now the capacity building program we have is basically based on what is needed. And to evaluate what's needed with the IAEA in Monaco, we design a questionnaire that we uh, distribute all around the world and we evaluated the needs in different countries. And that was one of the first evaluation. And you could see that in places like in Africa, a lot of the countries are in red. And red means no lab, no electricity, for example. In orange would be you have some kind of lab, but not really equipment. In green is that you have some equipment. And in dark green, is everything is fine. But it shows that in some you can't teach in the same way in a red and in a green country, of course. So we decided we need to adapt. And we have now this four-level capacity building program for ocean acidifications. We have level one training, which is where you have very little and you know very little. So we go and give basically basic training. And, and I do a lot of this with Andrew Dixon, that is on the picture on the left, who is a, the god of the carbonate chemistry. So we go and we basically set up the scene. Later, we have a level two training where people already have a little bit, they have, they have a decent lab. And then in that case, we show them more practically how you can do ocean acidification research. And that's an example of what we did in, in Kuwait. Then when people start to have more knowledge, we go to the level three. And level three is like we start to do real science. So it's not really a course anymore. It's more like a joint experiment. And we made a lot of these. One of them was in South Africa. And what was really cool there is that we actually had the time in the week to collect real data. And we were actually writing on the uh, paper uh, with a group of students all together. And we can show that even if you don't have the fancier lab in the world, you can still do really good quality science. And the level four is what we call collaborative research. And is basically creating a network of scientists from all around the world working on the same experiment. And one that is running right now is uh, called a CRP project and is evaluating the impact of acidification on seafood. So we have 18 different partners all around the world that receive some seed money to design and do an experiment on ocean acidification. So that's, you can think when you do uh, about this, like well, if you want to start working on that, don't hesitate to contact us and say, okay, I know there's been a training in Goa last year, but that's probably a level one training. So if you want to go to the next level, please contact us because we, we have teachers from all around the world that are willing to come and help. And, you, and we have success stories. So this is Carla, for example, that is uh, one of my PhD students. So I first met her in a level one training in Mauritius in 2016. She had no experience whatsoever in acidification. She just came and learned the basics. She joined a program called Peer to Peer, where you can uh, basically being paired with a scientist. So I, I, I started to work with her. Together we wrote projects. I, I tried to help her with training. So I invited her to my lab. So she came in 2016 to work and continued to work with me. In 2017, she could actually get successfully a PhD grant. So I started to work in collaboration with South Africa with her. And, and she's a brilliant student, so she did a lot of good work. She was one of the first to monitor uh, acidification and design exper biological experiment in South Africa. She came to a few more training, and now she's even a trainer. So she come as trainer to different training. So she's finishing her PhD right now as we speak. So that's a good, and, and she's kind of in charge of acidification work in her country. So she started from scratch four years ago, and now is a local expert. So it's possible. That's the message I want to, to, to tell you, is that even if you have no experience, if you have access to very little equipment, it's possible to do really good quality science if you want to work locally. All right, so I'm going to finish soon and, uh, and, and just finalize by saying a few words about what is the future. So what, what we really, if you really want to be useful, if you want to do science that's going to benefit society, you really have to think bigger than just the experiment you do in the lab because the ocean is facing a range of different stressors today. We have the global stressors, so I talked about acidification, but you also have global warming, you have hypoxia, you have increase in catastrophic event, precipitation, and so on and so on, on top of local problems. So you have habitat destruction, you have overfishing, you have local pollution, there's more than 100,000 toxicants out there. And if we want to do something that is useful, you have to understand what the priorities are. 
And that's something that is not always really clear in policies because we have a, a lot of interest today in trying to do something useful for the future. So for example, now the United Nations will start what is called the UN Decade for Ocean Science. And the goal is really for the next 10 years to promote ocean science. So there will be a lot of opportunities for young researchers to start their lab, start, start their work and so on. But what is not clear is like if you have to start somewhere, is how do, how do you decide what's going to be your work in the future? And, and the Swedish activist Greta Thunberg said it really clearly, the house is on fire. We don't have the time to play around anymore. We really need to focus on the main priorities and design excellent science to address them. And I like to think about this problem that way. Let's imagine you're out there and you're chased by these two guys. On one side, you have both a lion and the tiger. And let's say these are metaphors for, for example, global warming and ocean acidification. So two major problems for the ocean. If you focus only on one, like global warming and kill the lion, you're going to still have the tiger chasing you and you're going to be dead. So in that case, when you identify your priorities, you have to address both at the same time. But sometimes it's not always the case. If you chase by both the lion and the little kitten on the right, you can focus on one of the problems. And, and a good metaphor for that would be ocean acidification for the lion and microplastic for, for, the, for the cat. It's not that it's not a problem, but it's not a problem that will be that big in the short term. So if you have to prioritize, think about that. What will be the main challenge in my future? And use that as your research topic. Because all science is really interesting and you can do science just for the sake of it and I love to do that. But if you want to have an impact on society, you have to focus on what is really critical and do it extremely fast. We don't have 30 years in front of us. If we want to avoid catastrophic impact on the ocean, we need to focus on the main main problem, which would be overfishing, which will be acidification, climate, global warming. All these things are extremely important. But to finish with my last slide, I would say acidification is an important issue for sure. That's going to impact things you care about. And, and, and we understand better and better today. And, and urgently what we need is to, to motivate policymakers to lead to change in carbon dioxide emission. We need people to change their ways. And to do that, we need to identify what is the best science we can do locally to implement this. And, and recently I was watching a documentary about space exploration and, and you might remember in the 60s what Kennedy said about space, space exploration. And actually he was basically saying we need to do space exploration not because it's easy but because it's complicated. And I realized I can just take his speech, his, his speech from back in the days and just change a few words and it's extremely uh, relevant today. And I'm going to read it to you. It's a huge challenge that we have in front of us, but I, I, I have hope that all together we can address it. And, and you would, so if we take the Kennedy speech and turn it to the ocean, it will be we choose to protect the ocean in this decade and do the other things, not because they are easy, but because they are hard. Because that goal will serve to organize and measure the best of our energies and skills. Because that challenge is one that we are willing to accept and one we are, willing to, we are unwilling to postpone and one we intend to win. And I think that's really what should, what should motivate us. We, we have a huge fight in front of us if you want to, to rescue the ecosystem, if you want to rescue the ocean, if you want to, to, to preserve what we have, but I'm sure that all together we can do that. And I'm going to finish here. And, and thank you for, for, for being here. Thank you for your passion. Thank you for being ambassador for the ocean. And thank you for, for, for being here today. So I'm going to stop sharing and I'm more than happy to take uh, all your questions now. Thank you, Sam, for your nice talk. Indeed, it was an eye-opener. So those who are not from the marine biology background, or ocean background, for them, it's uh, really great to have this uh, kind of knowledge. And uh, Sam, I have uh, one question. So what do you know, like, even those questions are poured up in the chat box. Also. What is your opinion about the uh, estuarine ecosystem in the uh, near future? So, Estuarine yeah. ecosystem because uh, in in our place uh, it's very near the Sundarban estuarine ecosystem, the uh, world largest mangrove ecosystem. So, what what is your opinion in that uh, regard? That what what kind of uh, niche shifting or what kind of predatory interaction will be in future due to this uh, uh, anthropocene activities? Mm -hmm. 
I think it's the same for any kind of coastal zone ecosystem where you have a lot of variability already today. So that's part of the livelihood of most of these ecosystems. They are exposed to, to wide range in, in changes in, in a bunch of different things like pH, temperature, salinity, and, and most of these ecosystems are also extremely uh, impacted by, by human activity. So I can see that we have also inner seas and fjords here, which are similar. So there are in a way, most organisms there are already adapted to change. So that's the good news, is that they are, they are able to cope with change. But the thing is that that doesn't mean they won't be impacted because some of these organisms are also at the extreme of what they can cope today. And that means all the, the new additional stressors we are putting on them is making them, I mean, we can just reach a tipping point. Uh, and it's dependent in, I think it's different in different regions, it's different in different ecosystems. So that, that's why I meant if you really want to have, I don't have the answer to your question locally. And that's why you have to actually go there. And, and that's a great argument to, 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 to say we need to monitor this ecosystem. You need to understand what kind of viability is there. You need to understand what is the, the status of this ecosystem and then do experiment to see how, how far are they from there from the tipping point. But there are a lot of evidence that they can cope with a little bit more change because they are quite good at coping with variability. But in some places, definitely they are at the edge already. Uh, and that's really worrying. So I, that's that's my non-answer to your question because I don't really, it, it really depends on where you are. But that shows the importance of going locally and, and really understand what's happening. So you probably know better than me what to expect in your local series conditions. Yeah, uh, you'd be glad to know that we have just started our ocean acidification research in Residence University. So we recently started, as you told, uh, some guys have started from scratch. We are also in that state, basically. So we are yeah. in, in Residency, we are trying to develop that kind of uh, infrastructure for doing the ocean acidification research. I have another I question. Uh, this, sure. uh, if, 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 so due to ocean acidification, this Corals will be mostly affected in all the calcareous animals we consider. So with coral reefs, other uh, many fishes are also uh, linked up, basically. There's the coral yep. ecosystem is a very uh, diverse ecosystem. So mm. uh, do you think that uh, these fishes, uh, sometimes what they do, they migrate from one place to another place. Do you think they can uh, come back to the natural population uh, or it will impair their uh, otolith structure or something like that. I, I have read one Shane Connell's paper regarding that. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So what is uh, your opinion on that? That, that's a really big question. Uh, I think if you focus on the fish, that was kind of one of your, of your question. You, you, most of the time, fish are really good at coping with with pH changes. They have, they have regulatory mechanisms. But a few years ago, a guy called Finn, Phil Monday in Australia started to show that acidification was affecting the behavior of fish. So that was something that was a little bit uh, unexpected. So they, they they survive fine. Most of them, you have evidence that some fish are more sensitive than others. But 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 most of the time they cope okay. But it seems that it can influence their behavior. There is a huge controversy in the field today because there is problem of replication and so on, and uh, there are suggestion of fraud in some of these papers. But there are still some evidence that fish might be impacted indirectly to change in, in their behavior. So for example, they they have problem fighting their food and so on. But as you said, they can also migrate most of them. Uh, so I would say like fish are probably not. Uh, one of the main target if you're interested in direct impacts. However, you have indirect impact through the, the, the food web. And that's something that you can really expect to be much more important because what might happen is the, the quantity and the quality of the food is going down. And that, that indirectly will have an impact on fish. So if you check all the species that are around directly, the one that will be the most impacted is the one that have calcium carbonate structure that are exposed. So coral reef for sure. Uh, theropods, or there you have a bunch of species like that, that that don't have a lot of mechanisms to cope with that. Then you're going to have species that are at the extreme of what they can cope with, or they are adapted to really stable conditions. So species in the tropics or in the Arctic regions tend to be much more sensitive than the one in the temperate region. So that's another kind of the key we have. But uh, yeah, so that, that would be this. I would say like you calcifiers that are that don't have a lot of regulatory structures are real. the one living in stable environment are also very sensitive. Thank you for your answer. Now I will hand over to 
uh, Monica Ghosh, who is a scholar of marine ecology laboratory. She will pick up some questions from the chat box. Yeah, I can see there are a lot of questions in the in the the chat. I don't think we're going to have uh, the time to go questions. through all of them. What I'm going to yeah. do is put my yeah, email. So guys, I'm putting my email yeah, in yeah. the yeah. in the chat. And if you have a question I don't have the time to answer, just drop me an email and I'll answer later. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir, for uh, handing over me. Um, good afternoon, all. And thank you so much, Dr. Sam Dupont, for such an inspiring talk. And it has very um, stimulating and gives an uh, overall glimpses. Uh, of your research effort in the field of ocean acidification and uh, your talk is very appropriate at the time when ocean acidification is uh, an emerging global problem and have a negative impact on the life of the ocean. So in this backdrop, uh, your talk is very uh, informative and uh, a great boost uh, towards our better understanding uh, on these burning issues. And also your speech has brought some new aspects um, on uh, the importance of capacity building to fully address the challenges of ocean acidification. So thank you very much for uh, this enlightening and uh, stimulating presentation again. And I'm sure our participants uh, um, also enjoy thoroughly your talk and gather knowledge. So uh, with this, uh, let's move forward to take some questions from like the box. The first question is from Onudipi I. Uh, she is asking, is ocean particularly more vulnerable to acidification than any other aquatic ecosystem? Sorry, can, can you repeat the question? I tried yes. to find it in the uh, chat. Is ocean particularly more vulnerable um, to acidification than any other aquatic ecosystem? Oh, OK. Uh, actually, no. Uh, if you go into uh, into uh, some lakes and freshwater ecosystem, the variability is much higher because the ocean has an ability to buffer pH changes. So in, in some aquatic ecosystem, you can have several pH unit changes over a short period of time. So and, and, and we also had like in the 70s, the, the acid rains issue. So there's been like huge fluctuation in pH in other aquatic ecosystems. So the ocean, relatively speaking, has short, less variation. But that doesn't mean that it's a good thing or a bad thing. The thing is that most organisms then didn't develop really strong ability to, to, to cope with pH changes. So making them really sensitive. So we expect actually that despite the fact that there is less variation more in most of the places in the ocean as compared to other aquatic ecosystem, organisms there are much more sensitive. So that's why scientists are really worried about this. Okay, thank you. Um, our next question is from Orja Chakraborty. She is asking, what is geological buffering? And if glacial runoff increases uh, with rock floor uh, to ocean, Will it provide alkalinity to the ocean and uh, balance ocean acidification? That's a really good question. Thank you for this. Uh, so basically, what's going to happen eventually is that you're going to have something called weathering, meaning that with the increase of carbon dioxide, you have the decrease in pH that's going to lead to dissolution of calcium carbonate rocks and so on. And eventually, you're going to have an increase in alkalinity, as mentioned, and the pH will go back to normal. I, that's going to happen. But that's going to take hundreds and hundreds of years. So the best case scenario, if we cut carbon dioxide today, that will take probably three to four hundred years. So yes, you're right. Eventually, the ocean will, will heal itself and buffer it through change in alkalinity. But that's going to take hundreds and hundreds of years. And in the meantime, the consequence for marine life will be dramatic. So we, in a way, if you're interested, that's two different time scale. You have the, the time scale of the impact on life and the time scale of weathering, and and the weathering won't be the the solution in the short term. And that's that's why we need to find other things to do. But uh, you're right. Also, with with the the, the problem with with the, the the melting of of water in in the, in the north is that is basically diluting the alkalinity. So in some places, it's going to make things worse. We have a decrease in salinity. Uh, and that's making the water more sensitive to CO2 changes. Thank you. I guess Orja got his uh, answer. Next question is from Procheta Pal. Uh, is the magnitude of ocean acidification related to temperature and latitude? 
Mm -hmm. Also, so a very good question. So I didn't say enough about chemistry, it seems. It's not because I don't really like it very much, I suppose. But that, that's a good question. So there is a temperature, so there is a latitude and temperature impact. The, the, the fact is that in cold, the colder water absorbs more carbon dioxide than warm water. So overall, you're going to have more CO2 absorbed in, in the polar regions. So that's one of the reasons there is so much interest in the polar region, because it's happening faster over there. So that's basically the answer. Yes, you have a temperature effect that would increase carbon dioxide solubility and, and, and capture in, in the cold water region, where acidification is the strongest. And we can already see today that in some part of the Arctic, the water is already corrosive, which is not happening in other parts of the world. But temperature can have, yeah. Yeah, I have another side also, is the temperature also, so acidification on the coastal zone, as I mentioned during my talk, is, 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 is much more variability. And the variability don't come only from the carbon dioxide from the air, but also from biological activity. So organisms breathe, and when they breathe, they produce calcium uh, CO2. And, and uh, oh, yes, yeah, so they produce CO2 and the pH goes down. So if you have a high productivity, then you have stronger uh, variation in pH and temperature, of course, increased productivity. So if you're in a place that is warmer and you have a lot of productivity, that might also amplify carbon dioxide uh, in, in the water and then the variability. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Dr. Dupont, for okay. your collaborative uh, answer. Uh, yes, sir. He has some uh, work to do. He told me earlier. Because yes, yes, yes. So, <clears throat> yeah. I'm concluding, sir. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> So <clears throat> you have nicely explained all the queries from our audience. Actually, we are flooding with questions, but uh, um, we apologize to the participants that we cannot accommodate all the queries in this session just uh, due to time constraints. But yes, um, we will surely deliver your queries to Dr. Dupont. And uh, on behalf of the organizers, uh, we thank you from bottom of our hearts um, for accepting our invitation, sharing your time and experiences with us. Uh, from your very busy schedule, you are a renowned marine biologist, and we know how busy you are. So, but uh, we are uh, very much privileged and honored to have uh, with us in this webinar, and it's a great pleasure to uh, hear from you. And uh, really, it's uh, been very motivated for all of us. So, thank you again. Thank you for being with us. Thank you so much. It's been a really great experience and I'm really excited to read all the questions. So don't hesitate to contact me if you, if you want more, if more information, if you have specific yes. questions. That would be my pleasure to go through this. So thanks again. That's been really great. Okay. Thank, thank, thank you, you so much. Thank you for your time and uh, okay, presentation. Sure. Thanks. Goodbye, sir. Thank you. Yeah. Goodbye. <laughs> So I would like to thank all the participants who uh, have been watching here. Uh, uh, and in, uh, we are very sorry for the technical glitches from the morning we are uh, facing. But any one of you missed uh, at the YouTube session, so uh, don't worry. It will be uh, available for your future watching in YouTube. And uh, those who have not subscribed our channel, please subscribe for, um, get, uh, uh, for the update of the remaining sessions. So, with this, uh, let's conclude uh, this technical session. Sir, do you have uh, anything to say? Yeah, yeah I, I, I okay. have some uh, As Monica told, actually, we are very sorry for this uh, happened due to internet connectivity and other issues. And I request all the participants who are there, please join in our Telegram group. So in Telegram group, we are posting the latest development, what we, we are facing. So this link has already been posted in Telegram group. So you can join from there. And uh, keep in mind, when joining, please mute yourself or your video should be off to uh, reduce the bandwidth of the internet connectivity. And moreover, so this uh, in Google Meet platform, we cannot accommodate all the participants. That's why after the we are recording all this uh, session and soon after finishing this talk, of every speaker, we are putting it on the YouTube channel. So please, you can uh, stay tuned in our YouTube channel. So uh, we are also again we are saying sorry for our uh, uh, this technical glitches problem which we are facing. So with this today session, we we are concluding. And today morning we have uh, uh, 
Dr. Raymond Tibi was first talk at 11 o'clock. So before that, we will put the uh, Gmail link at Telegram group. So please join the Telegram group because otherwise we cannot uh, uh, tell you the how to what are the updates are going on. Okay. So because uh, we cannot send mail more than uh, 100 mail okay, per day. So that's why uh, joining in Telegram group would be the best option for this kind of uh, situation. Okay. Anyway, thank you for joining with us and uh, see you tomorrow.